What is your rewriting process? Well, first, I pound my head on the floor for a couple of times. And then, no, my rewriting process, it depends. If I'm getting notes from people and I'm writing a spec script, uh, a spec script is a, a script I'm writing, nobody's paying for it yet, that I'm hoping to sell, then my process can take some time. I'll think about it. I'll think about their notes. I'll try to make them work if I think they're going to improve the story. Sometimes uh, I've gotten notes where, uh, actually I finished a film, I, I, I had a rough cut, showed the rough cut, somebody, I, I could see that it was slow, somebody came up to me and said, look, let's talk about this because I think there's a problem here. And he said, um, you have to do this more cinematically, you have to intercut this and you have to cut that and do that. He gave me some really good suggestions and I said, you are so right, I hate you now. Now I have to make major changes in this film. Okay. And I did it, and it was a much better film for that. Uh, sometimes people give you notes that, that just don't make sense. And that happens, and you have to differentiate. You have to stop and think, do I really mean to say what they're telling me I want to say, or do I really, really mean to say something else? Is it something that uh, I need people to like? Because not everybody's going to like... Um, not everybody's going to like Barbie. Even though Barbie was a very good film, not everybody's going to like Barbie. And I know people that hated it. Uh, there are reasons to like it uh, and there are reasons to hate it. So not every suggestion is going to be good. Not every reader is going to understand your script. Not every reader is going to see, in reading the script, see what Barbie turned out to be. So it took some visionary people to understand what Greta Gerwig had in, in her mind which was this big explosion of color and people and things that you didn't see in Oppenheimer, for example, which was, came out at the same time. Very, very different films, very different, but both immensely successful. So writing for the audience of one and then the second audience of one and the third audience of one and then the audience of 145 for an independent film or 5,000 for a, a big special effects film, that's a skill. Sure. And some people might like a smaller story, like Lady Bird, which I absolutely exactly. love. Which was terrific. Mm -hmm. Lady Bird was a terrific yeah. film. But not everybody's going to like that film. That's Certainly true. not everybody that liked Barbie is going to like Lady Bird. Yeah. And not everybody that liked Lady Bird is going to like Barbie. People write different films at different times in their lives as well. And you want to be able to do that. And you want to be able to write a big film or a small film. Sure. Whatever you want to write as a writer, what's important to you, on the one hand, on the other hand, you have to be able to write what somebody wants you to write. If you're hired to write uh, out of the blue, somebody says, look, I need, a, I need the next version of the Mattel world or the next version of the Marvel world, and it has to star this guy and this guy, and they have to be in a big fight on Mars. Can you write that? And you'll say, sure. Okay, let's talk about it. And you will write that. If they say, uh, look, I have $10 million, go make the film you want to write. That never happens, but okay, let's say it did happen. It happens to some people because let's say you're, um, oh gosh, I'll come Christopher, Christopher, Nolan. Christ Christopher Nolan. Let's say you're Christopher Nolan and Christopher Nolan comes to you and says, look, I need $50 million to write a film, to do a film. And you'll say, uh, great, when can you have the first script? That's all you'll say because he's made tons of money and he's done great films. Sure, sure. Yeah. Or, or again, comparing Memento to uh, Oppenheimer, right? Exactly. Different audiences. So different, mm -hmm. so different. Sure. And, but that's how he made his name. Uh, actually, he wrote that with his brother. So oh, okay. that's how he made his name. And that's how he had the ability, the ability to say, okay, I want to make another film. Mm -hmm. And would you fund me? Because it made money. Sure. That's the, that's the key. If it makes money, you can get money. What does it mean to read for structure? Okay, well, when I say when you rewrite, when you finish the rewrite, you have to read over the script several times. And one of the times is you have to read it for structure to make sure that all the wheels are on the car and that the car has the steering wheel, the car has the accelerator and the brake. In the case of a film, you have to make sure that the structure makes sense, that uh, you have the seven points, that they move the story, that all the scenes move the story. And 
scenes have to have structure as well. Scenes and sequences have to have the structure. So every scene has a seven point structure, although we don't always see all the points in that scene. Sometimes you can leave off the first part of the ordinary life. You can leave off the return to normal life and just have those things to keep you in, in suspense. You can even leave off the final challenge if we know how it's going to turn out or we find out how it turns out by going to the next scene. And they do this a lot in television to hold you over a commercial. So we don't actually go into the final challenge. We just approach the final challenge and we see what it's going to be. And then the next scene will show the person after the final challenge and we understand what happened in that. However, if the final challenge is an important thing to do, for example, if it's a Jackie Chan movie and the final challenge has to be a fight, well, we were, we're going to want to see the final challenge. But we don't necessarily need to see uh, the, the return to normal life. If we see him in the next scene doing something else and we know that he's okay and the normal life has come about and everything is all right. But there were seven points in that scene. We just didn't see them all. Sometimes you can even leave out the middle. There's all points in a scene you can do that. In a, in a sequence, you can do the same thing. A sequence has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Seven points in a sequence made up of scenes that each have seven points, whether we see them or not. So a sequence has a good structure. If the sequence has a good structure and you have several sequences, and some people structure their movies in seven or eight sequences, that's another approach to a movie, um, which I don't necessarily agree with, but it's, it works. Um, if you have the sequences have structure, then your film will have structure. And if your film has structure, you'll be satisfied. And the idea is at the end of the movie, is the reader or the, per, the audience satisfied with what happens in the film? They don't have to be happy. They don't have to be sad. They just have to be satisfied that it made sense. This is the way it should be. And it's, excuse me, everything is okay at the end. I would imagine uh, doing a structure test on something like Memento would be difficult, uh, or not? Well, as I described earlier on, uh, Memento has structure two ways. It has a backward structure and a forward structure, depending on which part of the film you're watching. If you're watching the um, colored, uh, the colorized version, not colorized, but it's in color, if you watch that, it's backwards. But if you flip it, it's forwards and it has seven points. If you watch the black and white version, it goes seven points on the nose all the way through. So it's perfectly structured. You just have to know how to look at it to see the structure. Uh, and it was interesting that he did it backwards, but he did it, I don't know if he wrote it backwards at first or he, he edited his script to write, to do it backwards, but it, it worked. And if it didn't have the right structure, it wouldn't have worked. How does a writer know they are done with their draft? <laughs> That's one of the hardest questions a writer has to ask. There's only one way to know if you're done with a script, if you're done with your rewrite, and that is to reread it several times and to figure out if there's anything more you can add to it. If there's nothing more you can add to it to improve it, then it's done. If there are other things you can add to it to improve it, then you have to continue to rewrite it. Okay, S sounds, sounds logical. What if the writer thinks that the draft is done, but they're getting feedback from other people that doesn't seem done? How, where, where does that shift take it, dep place? it depends on who's giving the feedback and how they're giving it. So as I described before, uh, if you have your trusted advisors telling you uh, and they agree that it's not done, then you need to look at it and say, well, why? What's not done? What, what would you add to it? And create a dialogue with that person or those people to figure out what needs to be the next step. If it's the producer that says it's not done, and this happens all the time, uh, then you have to say, okay, uh, if the producer's smart, the producer will say, well, the problem is we don't have a strong enough character. The character is not dynamic enough or the character is not active enough, he's very passive, uh, or, and I've given notes like this all the time. I just did one and gave a note that way, and that character had to change 
um, that person had to change that character and to make that character drive the story instead of being driven by the story. There's a very big difference there. So if a producer's giving you notes, they have the paycheck. So you have to uh, somehow or another make sure the producer is satisfied by the script or they'll take it away. And they, that's happened. That's happened to me. That happens to every writer. It's taken away and somebody else finishes the script. That happened in Shakespeare in Love. Well, it wasn't actually taken away. The, the Mark Norman couldn't uh, finish the script because he had another um, obligation. But the script was not done. It needed to be, be rewritten and he didn't have the time to do it. So Tom Shepard came in and finished the script. So uh, you never know how it's going to be and you never know who you're going to deal with. But you, you know at a certain point when you can't make any changes that improve the script, you're done with it. But if somebody else tells you something about it that sparks to you and then you say, oh yeah, that would make it better, then it's time to do a rewrite. If they tell you something that is not going to make it better, then you have to figure out a way to deal with that. To either say, no, if it's one of your trusted advisors, you can say, that's not exactly what I want to do with the script. Or if it's the producer that's paying you, you have to find out what they would see, what they would do to make it better. How many times do you think that happens in a professional writer's life where their work is taken away from them or their work for hire and someone else will finish it? How many times does that happen? Every day. It's happened to me. It's happened to me on, um, well, it's, it's only been taken away once. But on writing for television, often they'll, they'll say, you know, we have to do this or we have to do that and I'll have to make some changes. Or what's also happened to me is they make changes on the set, have nothing to do with me, so I don't even know what's going on. Uh, when I was working on The Twilight Zone, and they were shooting in Canada, they would make changes on the set and not consult with us. Or when they were shooting in Canada, it was during the, when the writer's strike uh, had, in that year came about, 1987 I think it was, 87 or 88, when they were, sh they were shooting in 88, um, they would make changes, sometimes changes that were not good changes, but we just had to live with it because we couldn't make any changes. We were not allowed to make any writing changes because we were on strike. So things happen and you just have to go with the flow. It's not like writing a novel where you just deal with probably one person making the changes uh, or asking you to make changes, that would be your editor or your trusted advisors. I mean, my latest novel, uh, I showed around to uh, three or four people. They read it. Some of them had some changes. Um, some were good. One change came up over and over again. And I said, okay, I'm going to have to make a change in the book. And I did that change. Uh, and it was a better book for it. So sometimes that can be very positive. My, as it turned out, my uh, editor, uh, my publisher, didn't have any changes to make. Once I turned it in, that was it. And they published it. So it's, it's out now, as a matter of fact. It's called Lies, All Lies, and you can get it on Amazon.com. And what's it about? It's about, <laughs> let me see if I can distill it for you here. It's about a mid-30s actor, director, uh, writer, who is standing poolside at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, soaking wet, holding a pair of tickets to the Emmys that night in 2019, and he doesn't know who, the, who he is, where he is, or who is that woman in a string bikini next to him talking to him. And he has to figure out who he was, who he wants to be, and then he has to make those changes to make that happen. Wow. And is, are these metaphorical questions, or he has amnesia? He has amnesia. Oh, he has amnesia. Yeah, okay. As a result of an accident. Okay. And, and a, a trauma, a personal trauma. So, and possibly drug use and alcohol use. I mean, he was, he was a bad person in some ways oh. and got himself into trouble. But he was good enough to get, to get the life that he had. Sure. And he was a, a well, he, he goes to the Emmys that night. He wins two Emmys. So he was good in his field. But he realizes that he was bad as a person, so he has to make some changes. So that's the process of the novel, is him coming to grips with who he was, figuring out who he was, figuring out what his relationship was with this woman, with the other women in his life, with his children, with his parents, 
with his boss, with the uh, other people in the uh, sitcom that he's working in, with all those people, and figuring out what to do with his life after, after understanding who he was and how he wanted to change.